Well, brothers and sisters, we gather tonight to continue our study of James chapter 5, the last chapter of this this, uh, epistle. Uh, Lord willing, tonight we're going to study through chapter 7, uh, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Uh, and we'll see how it goes as we get started. Um, but before uh, before we study, we should read the whole text. Uh, so we have the full context. So I'm going to start reading uh, back in 4.13. Uh, and of course, as is uh, our habit, uh, before we read, we're going to pray. So please pray with me. Mm. Father, we, we just read the story of, of the martyrdom of Mr. and Mrs. Gordon for the cause of Jesus. Lord, as, as gruesome as their death is, how wonderful their faith in you was, or that they would risk their lives for the glory of Jesus. Lord, that, that you tell us to not fear him who can destroy the body, but him who can destroy both body and soul. So Lord, we come before your word trembling, Lord, recognizing your majesty, your worth, your beauty, Lord, recognizing that you are worth not just our very selves, but our, our, our entire lives. So Lord, as we come to your word, we pray you would reveal yourself as this beautiful God, this worthy God. And Lord, that we would be patient in tribulation, looking to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to read James starting in 413, all the way through the end. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's the word of the Lord. Well, uh, last week we covered verses uh, one through six of chapter five. 
So, Lord willing, this week we're going to continue um, picking up in verse 7. Um, so, as we get started, can someone summarize for us verses 1 through 6? Who who was James talking about there, and, and what is he warning them of in those verses? He was warning them not to trust um, and, and put all their priority in their wealth because mm -hmm. their wealth could not, can't, uh, they can't take it with them when they die and they can't buy salvation with it. That's right. Yeah, well said, Tammy. Yeah, so he's talking to the rich and the, the dangers of rich. It can't buy salvation. Don't put your hope in it. Yeah, anything else that, that he said there in those six verses? They're they not, should, they're not they shouldn't people. mistreat people. Yeah, so they should, shouldn't mistreat people, right? So there's, they clearly, it says that they're holding back the wages of their laborers. They're um, the people who are mowing their fields. Uh, so it's clear they're, they're oppressing uh, the poor. Tammy, we're going to add something else? That was, that was pretty much okay. what I was going to okay. say, that Great. they were taking advantage of people. Yeah. Yeah, and, and particularly James's... Uh, mm, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it exhortation, his warning to them there in the first verse, right, is, is that they should mourn, they should weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon them for, uh, in, as a result of these things that they have done. So, so he's, he's promising them or warning them of, of coming judgment um, because of their, their sinful behavior. Um, so they're, I would say veiled references, but but certainly references to coming coming judgment. To uh, he makes reference to the last days, uh, implying that there is a, a day that is coming when all will end. Um, so that kind of introduces us to our passage tonight. But I just want to, before we actually dig into verse seven and, and forward, just based on what we thought about last week in verses one through six, what are ways people might respond? What are ways people might take action against the kind of people that we thought about last week in verses one through six? So if, if you're maybe one of the people who are being oppressed or you're kind of a, an innocent bystander on the side, what, what might you be tempted to do uh, in response to what these rich oppressors are doing? Do something and do it quick. Do something and do it quick. Okay. So you're, you're called to action and urgent action. Okay. That's what my my earthly heart would say. Okay. Calton, can I clarify something? Yes, you can. When you're asking what might you be tempted to do, are you asking from perspective of the recipient of the letter or mm. from just a, a witness of something happening? Uh, either or. I'm just curious. What normal reactions to this would be? Do you have, have one of those in mind, Mo? Uh, well, I was just thinking, like, if you're, like, a witness to this, yep. um, you know, you might be tempted to take justice into your own hands kind of okay. thing. Okay. Uh, you know. Yeah, there are lots of ways we can imagine what taking justice into your own hands might look like, but yeah, do, do something about it. Yep. Yeah. I think, I think all of us probably have that, that instinct um, that something must be done that we can't, we can't let this situation continue and all the more, right. We can imagine if we're actually in the, uh, in the, the shoes of those who are being oppressed, if, if, we place ourselves in their situation, how much more we feel like we need to act, uh, to resist, to, to respond. Well, so starting in verse seven, we have kind of the, the flip side of the condemnation of the rich oppressors that we saw in verses one through six. Um, after in those first six verses, James, James announcement of, of judgment for the oppressors, this he's going to address the people's response to oppression. So he's turning to those who are, are either being oppressed or maybe are on the sidelines watching this happen, 
uh, know that it's happening in their community and he's going to instruct them in how to how to respond uh, whether or not it's it's take action whether or not it's to do it urgently well and and what we'll find out in just a few seconds uh, I would summarize what he teaches in the first few verses seven through nine is that Christians must remain patient because the judgment day is near uh, Christians must remain patient because the judgment day is near he'll go on um, kind of in the middle of this paragraph, verses 10, 11, um, that their patience must be uh, like the, the prophets who went before them. Um, and, and he kind of wraps up in verse 11, reminding them of God's treatment of Job, uh, who suffered greatly, that Christians must persevere in faith until they see God's great compassion, the same compassion that was in time showed to, to Job. So we won't get through all that tonight, but that's kind of the the, the gist of his response or how he calls Christians to respond in, in verses 7 through 11. Um, so I would, I would summarize the, the passage like this, that Christians should endure evil with patience, knowing that the Lord, will ju- the Lord the judge will come soon. And as we wait, we must not grumble or make false promises. So just so you kind of lay in the lane where we're going. So let's get into to verse 7 then uh, and break this down. Who then is James talking to here in verse 7? Who does he address? Brothers, brothers, and sisters. Yeah, brothers, which we note time and time again throughout this letter, right, uh, is, you know, in, in Greek, it, it would imply both, both brothers and sisters. Uh, brothers and sisters not being, again, James's physical, you know, uh, siblings, right? He's talking about his family uh, in, in Christ, right? His adopted brothers and sisters uh, of the same father, the heavenly father, All right? So he's talking to Christians, which is, we'll note, right? A transition, right? In verses one through six, we, we began by observing that it, it seems like the way he's talking to these people, that they're, they're not Christian, uh, that what they, that they're expecting in their future is is condemnation and judgment that their conduct is is not in line with the gospel um so this is a transition now he's he's changing audience um after having addressed these non-christian uh rich oppressors he's he's turning now to to the christians uh what word does james use here in verse seven to link what he has been saying to what he's going to say next What's his, what's his linking word? Sorry. Therefore. Therefore, yep. Let me change colors here. Yeah, so obviously, uh, how, many, how many times can I fit this into a study, right? Whenever you see therefore, you have to ask why it's, what it's there for. Right. Um, yeah, this, this word shows us that James understands what he's about to say is linked to what came before. Uh, you know, you make an argument or a, a statement and in light of it, therefore, do this or believe this. Or So he, he is grounding this, this admonition to believers in seven and falling is the logical consequence of his condemnation of the rich that, that came before. Uh, so in light of the coming judgment on rich oppressors therefore brothers therefore brothers what what is his his exhortation what is his command to believers here in verse seven be patient yes be patient be patient uh i don't know if you guys noticed maybe you can count now how many times does that word patient or patience show up in in this section verses seven through eleven this paragraph At least four times. Four times, yeah. Yeah. So I see it again in the latter half of, of seven, right? Uh, as he's talking about the, the farmers being patient. Um, let's see. Again, he repeats the, the command here in verse eight. And then in verse 10, 
appealing to the prophets as an example of suffering and patience. So four times uh, that I count, maybe there's another one I'm missing. Looks good. And then he uses a similar word, uh, has a, a, a kind of associated meaning, but in uh, verse 11, he uses twice this idea of steadfastness. So steadfast, steadfastness. Other translations, I think, put this as endure and endurance. Um, a similar, similar idea, to be patient and to endure, to be patient and steadfast. So clearly, what we're identifying here is the theme of the paragraph, right? The theme of his, his exhortation to Christians. Four times he says patient and patience, twice endure or be steadfast. Clearly, the, the theme of what he's, he's talking about here is, is patience. And that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, I think Bill was the one who said that, that our natural response to the rich oppressors is to do something and, and do it now, an urgency, right? So what, what James understands is that's the natural response, is to, to do something with a sense of urgency, or at least to feel a sense of urgency, if, even if there's nothing we can do immediately. And what he's exhorting is, is patience, endurance, steadfastness. Uh, just to be clear about what patience means, I think we all know what patience means generally, but, but just to be extra clear, what is the difference between patience, be patient, and, and indifference? What's the difference between patience and indifference? Patience is active. Okay. Indifference is inactive. Okay. Patience is active. It, it is actually doing something. Uh, where, where indifference, you say, is, is inactive. Okay. Well, also, and you can care and be, mm -hmm. in, and be patient. Like, yeah. just because you're willing to endure through something doesn't mean that you don't care. Where indifference literally means that there's no feeling good or bad toward it. That's right. Yeah, so, so he's not saying calling them to be indifferent to the suffering, to be indifferent to the evil, right? To not care about the evil, but, but to be patient. So yeah, it involves, you can have all the same feelings of, of uh, pain in your suffering, hatred for the evil, uh, desire for justice, all these kind of feelings. So he's not saying being, being different, but he's calling them to, to patience, to, to wait, uh, to continue, to endure. Any other thoughts, the difference between patience and indifference? Being patient means you still have an objective in mind. Being indifferent okay. means you have no objective. Okay. So it means we care and we have an objective. All right. Those are all good things. And we need to keep those in mind as we as we walk through what James's vision of patience is, uh, because they're they're he does call them to care. He does call them to have an objective in mind. Uh he doesn't say just be patient forever, right? There's, there's an end in mind. I think of just as a verse to, to kind of help us understand patience, Romans 8, 22, or sorry, 24 and 25. You don't have to turn there, but uh, Paul's talking about the nature of hope, uh, hope looking to the future, right? He says, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So we can just you know, see how Paul's connection, connecting this idea of, of hope and something not yet realized, you know, hoping in things that we don't see. Um, but he says, if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So I think that's, that's something similar to the vision that James has here of, of patience. I also think I'd, I would add that it's, uh, I don't, maybe opposite is too, too clear of a term, but, but it is not like anxiety right? Anxiety is a expectation of the future, right? When we're anxious, we're expecting something, but it's an expectation of the future that, that uh, comes with fear or dread, right? When we're, when we're anxious about, I don't know, we could be anxious about a test that you have to take. I don't know why I always think about school when I'm thinking about anxiety, but uh, yeah, when, you, when you're anxious about something, right? You're, you're expecting something to happen in the future, but you are doing so with, with fear or dread, Right, so this patience he's calling them to is uh, the opposite of anxiety. It's expecting something for the future, but not with fear or dread. It's a, it's a kind of eager expectation, uh, an expectation 
uh, of hope that helps us in, endure in the moment. All that about patient, uh, we, should, we should keep going. Uh, they are patiently waiting for something, right? Uh, in verse seven, until, right? There's an end of their patience. What are they waiting patiently for? Coming of the Lord. Yes, the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Right? So again, their, their patience doesn't, doesn't last forever. Um, uh, but there's a definite end date in mind, the coming of the Lord. And if, if you recall, I think, um, I think James has already referred to Jesus' second coming back in chapter 5, um, though not in as, as clear terms. Uh, right, he says back in five one, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So, so in both of these paragraphs, he's dealing with something that's coming in the future. Uh, one is to be, you know, right now you should deal with it by by weeping and howling because miseries are coming. And now to the Christians, he's calling them be patient for what is coming. It's it's the Lord who's coming, and I think he's he's dealing in both. 5.1 and 5.7 with the, the same event in the future, but for one, it means judgment, and for one, it means salvation when the Lord comes. Uh, just, just to go back to basics and be very clear here, uh, what, you know, Jesus already came once, right? Uh, so that's not the coming of the Lord he's referring to. He's, come, he's referring to a second coming of Jesus, second and final, I might add. Um, what what other uh, things do we associate with Jesus' second coming? What is going to happen, according to the New Testament, at Jesus' second coming? What will his second coming bring? New heavens and a new earth. Okay. So, yeah, recreation of all creation, a recreation. So new heavens, mm -hmm. new earth. Okay. What else? Not to be redundant, but he comes back visibly. We'll see him. Okay, so yeah, Jesus uh, personally. That's right. There's something about giant locusts, right? Giant locusts, Apache helicopters. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> so we could say cer so certainly something like plagues. Uh, mm. disease, war, uh, all the kinds of things that you want to, uh, in the book of Revelation, the predictions of, of both until the end and at the end. Yeah. So certainly the, the picture we have of the second coming in, in Revelation is, is of, um, we can summarize that as of, of judgment. And justice. Judgment and justice. Yeah, well said. Judgment and justice. But not for everybody. Not judgment and justice. Well, justice for everybody. Uh, but injustice, not judgment for everybody, right? Um, right? We look forward to the second coming, which is obviously the, the grounds of, of his exhortation here. Uh, it's salvation, right? It's, it's um, salvation for those who trust in Jesus. Um, it's, it's final salvation. Glorification is the word we often use for it, where uh, we will finally be with Jesus in, in glory, with glorified bodies forever. Now, we, we could go on. Uh, there's certainly more to say about you know, what will happen um, at the second coming, but I, I really think that gets at two of the biggest ideas of, of Jesus coming both as Savior for those who await his coming eagerly and judge as those who uh, do not await that with eagerness and faith, right? Those who uh, who hate him. So there's a great, great divide. And I think that divide is even shown in these paragraphs. You know, it yeah. means one thing for verses one through six and his second coming means a very different thing for seven and following. Um, I, do, I do think it highlights for us, uh, just as we think about Jesus' second coming in context, right? Um, that salvation is, is uh, an ongoing work, right? Often Christians call ourselves, and rightly so, that, that we have been saved by Jesus, right, as a past uh, event in the past tense. 
Um, but we also understand that we are being saved, right? The work of sanctification, that, that we are ongoing um, uh, in sanctification, being made holy uh, by the Spirit's work in us. But we still await salvation to come, right? That one day we will be finally delivered from sin and through death, uh, through uh, not, just, not just when we die and, and our spirits are, are separate from our bodies, but actually when we are, are in our bodies, again, resurrected and in this new heavens and new earth. So... Now, the gospel purchases all that for us, right? The, the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection didn't just forgive our sins, uh, the initial act of justification, but secures for us our sanctification, the ongoing work of the Spirit to make us into the image of Christ, to bring us into holiness, and secures for us ultimate salvation, the salvation that's coming that we call glorification. Uh, so this gives us a big, a big picture of the, the wonder of the gospel, uh, and it's, it's ever uh, ever, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Relevance for us. Uh, yeah, it's not just something that, that was good for us at one time to be saved from sin, but, but is continually good news for us. So this is what he's calling them to be patient for, right? He says, be patient therefore brothers until the coming of the Lord. Uh, next he's going to deploy an analogy, a metaphor, uh, to, to show us what our patience should be like. So he compares us or, or instructs us with the example of a, a farmer. Uh, so I'm not a farmer. Uh, I don't grow anything. Uh, I'm not really familiar with modern farming, but uh, we can kind of jump back to first century farming uh, 2000 years ago. Without uh, an irrigation system, what could farmers do to make their plants grow once they've sowed the seed? They water it. They water it. Okay. You have they, to take out all the weeds around it. Okay. They water it. Yeah. They, they yeah, weed, water, get you up there. You have to wait for it to rain, you know. But they cultivate the ground. I can tell you from my dad, they cultivate the ground mm -hmm. a lot and there's seasons for it mm -hmm. in a particular time. And you also compost, you feed it, you fertilize it. Um, yeah, so they'd, they'd be out in their fields fertilizing, um, you know, tending the plants, making sure they're protected, you know, keeping any, any animals vermins. that would try to eat it. Yep, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, but uh, what, what Kathy pointed out and what, what James is going to point out here that especially, you know, before the advent, you know, praise God, the technology that we have with the irrigation systems that, that allow us to make it rain when we want to. But yeah, it's certainly... Farmers in first century uh, Palestine, Israel would, would be very, very much aware that, that they are dependent on rain in order to see a crop, right? Um, as much as they can get out their watering can and, and water a little bit, um, right, they, they need rain. Um, even the, the water that they, you know, if they want to try to water, they need to get that from somewhere else. They need it, they need it to rain. So essentially, as much as farmers can do, uh, one of the, the greatest things that they need in order to uh, see their crop grow they cannot provide they need to wait for rain anticipate the rain in hope be patient about it as james says um he, you notice here he says see how the farmers wait for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains um so that's just a reference in the kind of mediterranean area um the primary rainfall was in kind of uh, October, November, kind of in the, the late fall. They're northern hemisphere, so the, the uh, seasons line up with us. Um, but uh, there would be a second rain in, in March and April. And depending on what crops you grow, depending on, you know, when you'd plant and when you'd harvest and those kind of things. But yeah, he's, he's making reference, which, you know, his, his audience would be very familiar with the fact that the, there's an early lane, rain in the fall and the late rain um, being in, in March and April. And we know, if you guys remember back from uh, verse four, that the people he's writing to are, are likely farmers. Um, maybe they're not landowners, but they are likely working on uh, the land of, of the rich, the fields of the rich. Remember, he references back in verse four, um, the cries of the harvesters, right? So these are people who, who work harvesting the fields of the rich most likely 
And so this is a really pertinent uh, illustration for his his audience that they must be patient. He calls them to look, see, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it. Though he's, you know, using this as an illustration for us waiting until the coming of the Lord. So I, I think I think it's helpful for us to even think about uh, there are some things that we do do while we wait, and there's some things that we can't do while we wait for the coming of the Lord. Just like the farmer can weed, uh, get out there and, and cultivate as much as he can, but he can't bring the rain. There are certain things that we do, we can do while we wait, and some things that we we can't ultimately bring about. So what are the what kinds of things can we can we do? Uh, and what things can we not do as we wait for the return of Christ? Can't predict when and uh, our Lord will return, the hour and the day. So we don't we don't speculate on when he's coming. That's right. Yeah, so so the a great parallel, just like we can't, so the farmers can't force those rain clouds to come. Uh, they, they can't direct them over their particular plot of land, over any other plot of land, right? Uh, we cannot compel Jesus Christ to come. Uh, yeah, that is, that is a secret. But what can we be doing? Growing our hearts. Growing our hearts. So yeah, and the, the, the field of our ministry is not uh, soil, but the soil of, of human hearts. So working on our own hearts, that's right. Growing holiness, growing love, eager expectation. What else? Spread the gospel. Amen. So we can be out there sowing more seed that God may cause to grow, right? Um, so calling other people to uh, repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls with the hope, too, that they can join in us that, that one day... Jesus will come back to save them. Yeah. What else? That's it. So we do is grow and share the gospel. Well, and edify each other. like Edify each other. Okay. There's interaction between Christians mm -hmm. too. It's not just yep. individual and finding new ones. There's yeah, that's right. Yeah, the kind of example, like exactly what James is doing here, right? James is waiting for the coming of the Lord. And while he waits, he's gonna write to other Christians who he knows are suffering and exhort them to also be patient. Yeah, he's he's encouraging his brothers, sisters in Christ uh, in the midst of their suffering. Yep. Mm -hmm. and this is the work, the work of the church. Yeah, I, I think it's so obvious we don't we don't even say it, but right, the, the call for, for Christians, um, though it seems like some were tempted as we read some of the New Testament letters, it's not to just kind of, you know, hole up and, and you know, wait for Jesus to come back, right? Uh, start a monastery and just stare at the clouds all day, right? We, we live life as, as normal um, until the hour of his arrival. Uh, we, we expect tomorrow to be here um, as we even expect even tonight that, that maybe Jesus will come. And that's something we can even do now, right? As we, we study the Bible, we, we're not going to pause this and just kind of stare up at the clouds and wait for him to come back, right? We should, we should study the Bible together. We should, uh, in a moment, you know, I don't know, maybe what you have to do tonight, uh, take out the trash, maybe clean up your house, right? You should, you should do those things. You should uh, read the news, make your investments, go to work tomorrow, whatever you have to do, right, as you expect the Lord to come. Um, but, but we know that we're still waiting patiently for, for his coming. Uh, well, in, in verse verse eight, he repeats the exhortation, right, to, to be patient. Uh, you also, meaning just like the farmer we just talked about, you also be patient. As he waits for the early and the late rains, you also be patient. So in addition to being patient, though, he, he tells us to do something with our hearts. What does he tell us to do with our hearts? Establish them. Establish your hearts. Does anybody have a different translation on that? I, got, I have um, be patient and stand firm. Stand firm. 
Do you know what translation that is? Oh, it's NIV? Yeah, NIV, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, stand firm, uh, establish, I think I think one other translation put it, something like have courage. Um, yeah, so if I, if I were to go and look up establish in the dictionary, predict that particular English word, right, it probably means something like setting up something on a permanent basis. Yeah, we're going to establish a, I don't know, a new business, <clears throat> right? Um, but, but we're talking about hearts here, establish your heart. What does it mean to establish when we're talking about hearts and, and patience? What, is, what does that kind of establishment look like? The first thing I think of is writing uh, God's word on your heart. Okay. So have God's word in your heart. How does that establish your heart? It um, allows you to, to determine between what's true and not true. Hmm. Okay. So it's an opportunity to um, maybe to have certainty about truth. I think of establishment as a commitment. Your family has established 1989 or 1986. You've established, you've committed to the Lord. What are you committed to waiting and where your yeah, home yeah. is? Okay. Yeah, so the idea of commitment is it's, you know, kind of starting out on a path and, and staying on it. Uh, not, not wavering at all, not, not being no. double-minded. Right. Okay. That's good. Commitment. Making your calling and election sure. Okay, so a reference to uh, is it Philippians? Um, making your calling and election sure. So, is it Philippians too? I feel like my brain's fried right now. Um, but yeah, the, the principle there being right that that to work out, continue working out your salvation, right? This is not just a done deal uh, that you know you pray to prayer once and, and you're good, um, but but continue to to live in uh, what God has called you to to in that way make your calling and election sure, right? It's those who endure in faith to the end that that are called. And I read established. I I think of build up. Build up. Okay. Build up your hearts. And when when um when James is talking about building up your hearts, he's not talking about yeah, you know doing cardio exercise so you have you know healthy hearts. Oh, you should do that, right? He's talking about uh, hearts as in the the center of our affections, of our will, of our of what we love, of what we do, right? Um, and that directed toward God. So to build up our hearts. Yeah. Now, these are all really good answers to something that, that might seem a little bit um, a little bit uh, vague or, or unclear, right? It's, I have the image in mind of, of uh, you know, fortifying a defensive position, right? Um, to be ready for what is coming, right? He's calling them to establish their hearts to get ready to make sure it's strong, their hearts are, are strong. Um, because, as he says in the next breath, right? For, because the coming of the Lord is at hand, uh, right? So they're, they're to be ready for this um, in holiness, in, in love, in eager expectation, because his coming is, uh, another word for that, at hand is, is near, the Lord's coming is near. So again, we see just within this first few verses of, of this section, two references, very direct references to, to Jesus coming. So he clearly thinks this is a, a big deal to ground their hope and patience in the midst of suffering by pointing them to, to Jesus' second coming. This is particularly what he has in mind as they establish their hearts, the, the truth that, that Jesus is, is coming soon. Uh, does this... The second half of verse eight, does that mean that James expected Jesus to return any moment? He's writing this letter to these Christians and he's like, guys, he's going to be here next week. Just hold on for a little longer. I don't think so. I think he's telling them that 
Have this in mind as your goal. Have this in mind as your goal. Parent. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think all among us, we read this letter 2,000 years later and say, well, that must not be what he meant. Um, and I don't think, you know, some people read this, read the New Testament and think actually the apostles were confused. They thought he was going to come back a lot sooner. First of all, Mark 13, 32, right? Jesus himself said for, uh, you know, concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor the son, only the father, right? So, so certainly uh, James would understand uh, he doesn't know when, when Jesus is coming back. Uh, Jesus himself uh, didn't. Um, but I think it also misunderstands what, what at hand means. At hand uh, or, or nearby, um, I don't think it means happening soon, right? He's not saying for the coming of the Lord is, is going to happen soon, uh, but that it could happen at any moment. Uh, you know, I, I try to think of an analogy for this. Right. When we when you try to keep things at hand, you know, uh, we mean like literally within the distance of our hand that they're that near to us. So at any moment, uh, you know, I keep my water bottle here, uh, you know, it's at hand. So at any moment when I'm thirsty, uh, when my throat is dry, I can get a drink of water um, or maybe another analogy for this, uh, though, a poor one, probably, you know, when you uh, are bringing a patient into the OR, you don't, you know, bring them in, wheel them in, and then get the OR ready. Well, let's get scrubs on. Let's get our tools set up. Let's get the lights turned on, right? You set up the operating room, get everything out and ready so that when that patient comes, we can we can get going, right? I actually assume that. I've never been in an OR when they're getting it ready. That seems like it'd be good practice, right? So I, th I think the idea here um, is uh, in the same way that everything is in place for Jesus' second coming, right? Right. Um, Revelation talks about him being at the door, right? Uh, so whatever door that is, that metaphorical door of him being able to open it and come at, at any moment, right? No other prep work is necessary. Uh, he could have returned in James's time. Uh, it's it's kind of pointless to talk about hypotheticals, but but just to be clear, like he could have, he could return today. Uh, and I'm saying that now, where in tomorrow, if he doesn't return, I will, I will think that's no less true that he could have returned today, uh, this very hour, right? The message of the New Testament 2,000 years ago was be ready, be ready. Like a thief in the night, he could come at, at any moment when you're least expecting it. So I think that's what, what James means when he says the Lord, the coming of the Lord is at hand, it's near, it's ready, um, that, that at a moment's notice, it, it could happen. Uh, it's not like, well, the, the coming of the Lord needs to happen, so here are the half a dozen things we need to get ready uh, up in heaven for him to come, right? No, it, it could happen at, at any at any moment. Obviously, we have to remember, you know, that for the Lord, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Um, he's, he's eternal outside of time. Uh, so, so some of the ways we talk about this is, is, is a little bit meaningless. But for us, right, um, from our perspective, it could, could happen at any moment. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Why would that be comfort to people who are suffering? The fact that that he could return at any moment, that his return is imminent. Why would that be comfort to them? Well, if you say his return is imminent, then it's just like it's all it's it's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Um, so the guarantee is what provides the comfort. That's right. Yeah, amen. I, I think that's so excellently said, John. It's it's not the comfort of that it's happening soon and that your suffering will be short because that, again, that's not what he's saying that he's coming soon, right? He's saying that it's it's certain, right? It, it is certain that he is coming. Uh, and we don't know when, but but it's it's he's is he's at hand in the sense that it's guaranteed, like it's going to happen. Uh, and and because of that you can have have confidence, and we've already talked about what what his second coming means, right? We said new heavens, new earth, uh, where Jesus is going to be with us personally, right? It means judgment uh, on on uh, the wicked and salvation for the righteous by faith, uh, perfect justice, all the things that these these um, people who are being oppressed are are hoping for, uh, that they need, they long for, right? Yeah. Um, 
Yes, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's a command, right? Uh, for us to establish our hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Part of that is fulfilled in, in what we're doing now, right, brothers and sisters? What we're, we're doing, you know, Wednesday, April 14th, 2021, is in reading James 2,000 years later, is establishing our hearts uh, for the coming of the Lord. What are, what are other things that we can do as Christians to establish our hearts uh, in the way that James has in mind here? I'll, I'll give out an idea. Uh, I think singing hymns about heaven is a good way to establish our hearts. Um, I read an article recently, some, some dude who got a PhD in something, uh, and his research was looking at the content of hymns in history. And, and he noted how in, in kind of our, our modern church age, you know, in the last decade or two, that the frequency of mentions of, of heaven uh, have taken a precipitous decline, right? That if you go back a few generations or, or even you know, hundreds of years ago, that Christians sang so much more about heaven. Uh, and, you know, part of, part of his argument, or, or at least what he noticed, is that, that part of that is because Christians suffer less now than they ever have, um, at least here in the, in the West, and therefore they're, they don't need the hope of heaven as much, that, that they think of, sing about other things. Um, but when, yeah, with, you know, without modern medicine and, and all the other things that, that relieve suffering, right, Christians thought a lot more about heaven. So one of my answers is uh, sing about heaven, uh, is to, to know good hymns about heaven and sing them, sing them frequently. Any other ideas how we can be intentional about obeying Jesus, James's command for us to establish our hearts in this way? I think it's really good to go back um, in the Old Testament mm -hmm. and just see how God worked mm. and what his plan was and, and his promises mm. Uh, mm. Um, and things that we, ne he, you know, he's they, all through the um, Old Testament is a shadow of the coming Messiah yep. and the Messiah came and he, God kept his promises. Amen. That's a really good point, right? If we want, if we want present faith in future promises, why don't we go look at people who in the past had to have present faith for future promises and see how God was faithful to those promises, right? Uh, the Bible is, is, you know, really a record of, of God's promises to his people and that, that he fulfills them. Um, yeah. So it's, Amen, Tammy. What a wonderful fuel of our faith for future promises and, and seeing how he has promised in the past and, and been faithful to those promises. Yeah. Well said. Any other thoughts about how we can establish our hearts? Yeah, I, I like to, you said hymns and you said mm -hmm. prayer, but just mm -hmm. to, um, in prayer and, and praise to the Lord, just for mm -hmm. his character, for who he mm -hmm. is, for his mm -hmm. omnipotence, for his mm -hmm. um, glory and for his um, salvation, just for all of it. And just sit and um, just spend time praising him for who he is. Amen. And his character doesn't change no matter Amen. what the circumstances. And just remember whom of whom I belong to yep. is remembering who he is and yeah. that helps in the circumstance. Amen. Well yeah. said. Yeah, if this establishment means like a commitment, right, moving in one direction, it's really helpful when we're tempted to change to remember he doesn't change, right, that that our circumstances haven't changed who he is. So yeah, that's a wonderful practice, Lori. Um, and maybe in your prayer, daily prayer, choosing one attribute of God and just spending a few minutes praising God for that, you know, for who he is, why that's wonderful that he is that way and what that means for for you, um, for us as his people. Yeah, it's a great idea. Praising God for his never-changing attributes. 
Well, I want to conclude uh, with some application about patience in particular. Uh, we've seen this, you know, three times in these two verses, be patient, be patient, be patient, right? That's his, that's his exhortation. So I want to look at uh, at least one, one other passage, maybe two uh, in the New Testament about patience. So if you would turn with me to Colossians 1, Colossians 1. Uh, in verse 9. So Colossians 1, 9 is, is one of Paul's prayers. Um, he's recording to this Colossians about how he prays for them, having heard of their faith. Um, and what I love about this prayer is, is often, you know, I don't know what comes to mind for you when you think about power in the Christian life, power in the Christian life, Maybe you think about, you know, casting out demons, um, courage to stand up to tyranny. Uh, maybe it means, um, you know, other demonstrations of, of tremendous faith. But when Paul prays for power for the Colossians, I think it's amazing what, what he thinks that power is for. So I'm going to read Colossians 1, 9 through 11, kind of the beginning half of this. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, through 11. Yep. Maybe. Yep. The beginning half of this prayer for I'm just going to read the whole paragraph. Let's go through 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wonderful paragraph, wonderful prayer. Pray this for me. It's a wonderful prayer. Um, yeah, so just to narrow in on that, what, what he thinks power is for, according to Paul, how, what, what does power in god's glorious might look like when it shows up in the life of a christian what is it for i'm thinking of verse 11 in particular and <clears throat> endurance and patience endurance and patience, yeah. and patience with joy with joy i don't know maybe maybe everybody else thinks this is normal but but that to me is like that doesn't sound like power uh I, maybe maybe i just have a wrong conception of of patience and endurance that it seems like a weak thing to do <clears throat> right right not at all right in paul's mind and and those terms brothers and sisters being strengthened with all power all power according to his glorious might god's glorious might right? The most powerful being in the universe, right? He who is almighty, who has all power, all power comes from him, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, right? That his, his prayer for Christians to have power from God is that they would be able to endure, to be patient, to have joy. Now, maybe, maybe for you guys, that's just, that sounds exactly right. But for me, that, that doesn't sound Normally, how we in the world think of what power is for, to, to be patient, to endure. I'd uh, rather it be to, to oppose or to destroy or to uh, have, have something else, right? Yeah, so I, think, I just think this is really encouraging for us as we, we think of, of James, his exhortation, especially in light of, of the oppression that these people are under, the suffering that they're under, uh, evil. Um, and, and as we began this discussion talking about that our our immediate reaction often in the face of those things is to, to do something. Um, and, and obviously to do something about oppression, we need, we need power. Uh, we need, that's why they're being oppressed is because they don't, they don't have power to do anything about, um, about their oppression, right? Not, not in themselves. And now when, when Paul thinks to, to pray for Christians to have power, right? What, what is he praying for power to do? It's, it's again, for all endurance and patience with joy. Yeah, so uh, I would just ask you, brothers and sisters, in the last few minutes, just to think about, um, maybe talk about some ways that that 
that you think um, today you are being called in particular ways in your life to uh, be patient, uh, that, that from God's power and glorious might, you, you need endurance and patience with joy. So yeah, you can yeah, just think about that for yourself. If you have something you'd love to share, I'd love to hear it, right? Because we're not in the circumstances that James is writing to exactly, right? We're not, not in the same shoes as, as these Christians being oppressed, but, but there are other circumstances we may be in that require us to have this kind of uh, patience. So yeah, does anybody like to share what, what are, as you think about what are ways that, that God is calling you to be patient uh, and to wait for the coming of the Lord? Well, I think about like the current state of our government. Mm, okay. And what do you mean, Hannah? Thinking about the Equality Act mm, that okay. might get passed, mm -hmm. and how that could affect, could affect like us as Christians. Mm, mm. Okay. Yeah, that's a great example of of um, what we we're talking about earlier. How patience can can often uh, be the opposite of anxiety, right? That we look to the future and what we, what we see, we fear, we dread uh, and what that re what that results in our hearts is, is anxiety. It's, it's those kind of feelings that we associate with anxiety. Yeah. So this is a great place to be called to, to patience, to, to hope, um, right. When we look to the far future, right. We know that, uh, that, uh, a, a certain political party doesn't win whatever their agenda is, right. Uh, kingdoms, rise and fall according to the will of God, right? In the end, the only kingdom that will endure forever, the only political party to have an eternal platform is Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's that's really good. Just thinking how this applies to, to our political hopes and fears. Thanks, Anna. Hmm. Anything else come to mind for your brothers and sisters? I think as we think about waiting mm. for the um, the Lord, it's not about waiting; it's about doing. Mm. Still, have, it's still doing it. I know it. it um, the sanctification, as you talked about that before. Yep. But you know, for me, it's and I, I know for other people who have grandchildren or unsaved mm -hmm. people in their family, yep. is yep. to continue to to live out and share the gospel. And my heart right now is mm. for my grandson. Mm. So, mm. you know, whatever that takes or looks mm. like, that is what continued mm. to serve for the lord as we wait mm. Mm. yeah well said Lord. you know i too have unsaved family i think many of us can relate right and it's it's very easy for us to to yeah uh be tempted to impatience in that to think that yeah that that we need to take control um that god doesn't know what he's doing um yeah so yeah, to be faithful in the midst of that, to be to be a, a faithful and fruitful evangelist, uh, but yeah, in the midst of that, to to be patient, um, to wait for the Lord, and to do so with joy. And yeah, we need power to do that. Amen. Any any other thoughts? How the Lord's calling you to patience. Okay. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, the exhortation of James five is is to call uh, is calling us to to patience um, for the coming Lord's at hand. Uh, it's a, it's a joy uh, to to end our time in prayer again, pointing you, brothers and sisters, to the coming salvation. Right, um, and it may happen tonight. Um, how glorious would it be if the next time I see all of you, it'll be in the perfection of of heaven, glorified with Jesus. Uh, as much as I, I love seeing your faces on Zoom and gathered at Sacred Baptist Church, I'd, I'd far prefer that. So let's let's close in prayer, asking for him to come soon. And as, as we wait to give us uh, patience and endurance. Let's pray. Father, the evil that, that Christians face in this world uh, is great. The, the pain that we suffer, um, not only because of the evil of others, but but in, in, uh, in the frailty of our bodies, in, in our own sin and weakness. 
Father, we, we would want to, to take vengeance for ourselves. We want to act. We'd want to end all this. But, but Lord, your word calls us to, to be patient. Lord, we, we do pray that like the farmer, we would be patient waiting for the, the early and late rains. Lord, we, we pray that we would have power. Lord, that we would be strengthened by your glorious might to have all power to, to endure with patience and joy. Lord, help us tonight to set our hopes on Jesus' coming. Lord, to, to know that, that at that time, everything will be made right. And Lord, that all of our greatest hopes and longings will be fulfilled. Lord, not because of our goodness, not because of, of our deserving, but simply because of your grace. Lord, we, we pray you would direct our hearts to that tonight. Lord, I pray that you would use our, our church, uh, our commitment to one another in this body to point one another to heaven. Lord, in the way we speak to one another, in the way that we conduct ourselves with one another, in how we, how we worship, Lord, how we sing, how we pray. Or that we would always have a mind, an eye on, on that day. Or we pray that you would come quick to rescue us from, from our sin and our suffering. It's in Christ's name that we pray this. Amen.